A young Polish man named Simon Rosenkier has seen things a young man should never have seen. In the concentration camp where he's imprisoned, he witnessed Dr. Joseph Mengele conduct a cold experiment on a Jewish man. The man did not survive his bath of ice. On another day in the camp, he saw the aftermath of what happens when doctors remove the hump from a hunchback. Rosenkier could not believe what he was seeing. But something he saw on many occasions was the Nazi sterilization experiments. These programs encompassed hundreds and thousands of people, some of whom were subjected to powerful x-rays in their genital regions. And then they came for him. Rosenkier was brought to the clinic one day and told he was going to have vitamin supplements injected into him. When he asked one of the doctors what the reason was, he got the response, these shots will give you muscles to work. The doctor then gave him a mean look and added, do you understand that, you redheaded dog? It seems the doctor did not like Rosenkier's hair color. Perhaps it was thought to be a Jewish trait for some people in Germany. Maybe Ginger wasn't seen as Aryan enough, although that's disputable. Rosenkier survived the camp and that's how we know about his story. In the 1950s, he and his wife tried to have a child. They couldn't and they soon found out that he was sterile. Many years later, he filed a lawsuit against the German pharmaceutical companies Bayer and Schering. The lawsuit accused them of supplying drugs to the Nazis for sterilizations. What they did to me is beyond right and wrong, Rosenkier told the New York Times in 2003. He might have survived the Holocaust, but his parents and four siblings did not. To understand the Nazi sterilization experiments, we have to look at what happened before the war. In 1933, the law for the prevention of hereditarily diseased offspring was passed. This meant that if the Genetic Health Court said a citizen had some kind of genetic disorder, by law they should be forcefully sterilized. It was actually similar to the USA's Virginia Sterilization Act of 1924, which ruled forceful sterilization was lawful on people afflicted with hereditary forms of insanity that are recurrent, idiocy, imbecility, feeble-mindedness, or epilepsy. This hasn't been a good look for the US since it was later said the program targeted minorities. The New Yorker wrote the story in 2018, How American Racism Influenced Hitler. Anyway, moving on, the German law covered many people including the blind, the deaf, and even folks suffering from alcoholism. Then in 1935, after some amendments were made, it included Afro-Germans whom the Nazis referred to as Rhineland Bastarde. Adolf Hitler often talked about what he considered contamination of German blood. As you'll see today, this is why the Nazis went to great lengths to stop many people from having children. Now let's look at a letter that was written by SS Oberfuhrer Brock and addressed to Reichsfuhrer SS Himmler. The date on the letter is June 23, 1942. This is how it starts. According to my impression, there are at least 2 to 3 million men and women well fit for work among the approximately 10 million European Jews. In consideration of the exceptional difficulties posed for us by the question of labor, I am of the opinion that these 2 to 3 million should in any case be taken out and kept alive. Brock said that it goes without saying those who are kept alive should not be able to procreate. But he added it was too expensive to sterilize people like they'd been doing for years to folks whom the Nazis said had genetic defects. He wrote castration by means of x-rays however is not only relatively cheap but can be carried out on many thousands in a very short time. Himmler wrote back saying I am positively interested in seeing the sterilization by x-rays tried out at least once in one camp in a series of experiments. Soon after, a memorandum was written. It contained this paragraph. The Reich leader SS has promised Brigade Führer Professor Klauberg that Auschwitz concentration camp will be at his disposal for his experiments on human beings and animals. By means of some fundamental experiments, a method should be found which would lead to sterilization of persons without their knowledge. On June 7, 1943, Professor Karl Klauberg wrote to Himmler, providing what he considered some good news. In the second paragraph, he wrote, the method I contrived to achieve the sterilization of the female organism without operation is as good as perfected. He meant of course that it worked, but his technique was barbaric. We now know that he took women from the camps and told them that he was going to give them a routine gynecological examination. He would first check to see if the fallopian tubes were open and then he would inject a chemical irritant. This would cause swelling and in time the tubes would grow together, thereby blocking them. This swelling could lead to something called peritonitis, which every medical resource on the web says if left untreated can infect the blood and cause death by sepsis. It can also infect the organs and lead to multiple organ failure and death. A website dedicated to the prisoners of Auschwitz wrote, while some of Klauberg's Jewish patients died in this way, others were deliberately put to death so that autopsies could be carried out. It said Klauberg sterilized 700 women this way, with many or most of them suffering permanent damage to their organs if they survived. The number is just an estimate, with some sources saying the number was much higher. As well as Jewish women, Romani women were victims of Klauberg's sterilization. 
After performing these simple but totally unethical procedures, Klaubert concluded in a letter to Himmler, one adequately trained physician in one adequately equipped place with perhaps ten assistants, the number of assistants in conformity with the speed desired, will most likely be able to deal with several hundred if not even one thousand per day. Another man who sent and received letters talking about sterilization was Horst Schumann. He sometimes worked alone and sometimes with Dr. Klauberg. We'll let the New York Times introduce him to you. On September 24, 1970, the newspaper wrote this in its lead. Dr. Horst Schumann, a Nazi concentration camp doctor, went on trial in Frankfurt today, charged with the killing of 14,549 mental patients under Hitler's so-called euthanasia program. Before we talk about his sterilization techniques, we should tell you a little about the Action T4 program. The Nazis believed that some mentally ill people were uncurable. Therefore, it was agreed that they should be subjected to involuntary euthanasia, which basically meant killing someone. Adolf Hitler referred to this as a mercy death. Hitler wrote that some mentally ill people were beyond help. He said some of them bedded on sawdust or sand, and perpetually dirtied themselves. He said some of them even put their own excrement into their mouths. This, of course, was a massive exaggeration and also a dangerous one. It did not reflect at all on mentally disabled people nor the physically disabled. The mass culling wasn't about mercy at all. It was about the Nazis' obsession with a master race and also about freeing up hospital beds and having fewer mouths to feed. It meant people who were sick, young, old, male, female, in Germany, Poland, and other European nations were put down like animals. It's thought 300,000 people were killed in total. Horst Schumann was one of the many people involved in the program, but he's also notorious for his sterilization techniques. One of them was sterilization by radiation. In 1942, he set up a radiation station at the women's hospital in the Auschwitz camp. There, both men and women were told they were going to have an x-ray, although they were not informed why. Reports say they usually stood five to eight minutes where the machine was pointed at the genital area. The process would sometimes cause radiation burns to the genital area and other parts of the body. At times, they would have surgery after to remove a woman's ovaries or a man's genitals. Some of them died, while the survivors, if unfit for work, would also usually be killed soon after. According to one report, roughly 1,000 male and female prisoners were subjected to x-ray sterilization, with about 200 of them undergoing follow-up extractive surgery. Another man who performed x-ray sterilizations was Victor Brock. Remember, he's one of those guys whose letters to Himmler survived. They were used against him when he stood trial. In one letter translated from German, Brock says a high enough dosage of radiation can make a man or woman sterile. He wrote, Castration with all its consequences will occur, since high x-ray dosages destroy the internal secretion of the ovary or of the testicles respectively. Lower dosages would only temporarily paralyze the procreative capacity. He wrote that men needed to be hit with 500 to 600 R and women 300 to 350 R each for about two minutes. He said that there was a problem, though, in that the high dose would cause them burns. Remember that the victims were not supposed to know what was happening to them, so the burns obviously gave it away. The Nazis did not want their enslaved workers to know just how awful things were for them in this respect. Brock wrote that he had one way to deal with the problem. He said they should let the person to be treated approach a counter where they could be asked to answer some questions or fill in forms, which would take them two to three minutes. The person behind the counter was actually the operator of the radiation machine. He or she would switch it on when the victim was filling in these questions. Brock said he believed one such installation could sterilize 150 to 200 people per day, but with 20 installations that would be 3,000 to 4,000 per day. The victims would not know what happened to them, at least at the time. Although Brock wrote in another letter that in all likelihood the victims would sooner or later realize with certainty that they'd been sterilized or castrated by x-rays. During the Nuremberg trials, Brock was asked, You were very interested in the question whether the people going to be sterilized would know whether they are sterilized or not, would gain knowledge of this procedure, is that correct? He replied, No, that was Himmler's wish. It seems that Brock had to concede back in the day that it was just not possible to perform the secret x-rays without the person finding out at some point what had happened to them. There are, of course, many survivors of the forced sterilizations, like the man we mentioned at the start of the show. One very outspoken survivor is Clara Nowak, who became a nurse in Germany after the war. She was also the activist behind the League of Victims of Compulsory Sterilization and Euthanasia. In 1991, she was asked how being sterilized had affected her later in life. She said, I still have many complaints as a result of it. There were complications with every operation I've had since. I've had to take early retirement at the age of 52, and the psychological pressure has always remained. On top of that, she said it had hurt all her life to see her friends and neighbors talking about their kids and grandkids 
when the Nazis had ensured this could never happen to her. She said her union had 88,000 people in it who had suffered from the sterilization and attempted euthanasia. Another victim was the writer and sculptor Dorothea Buck. In 2019, she died aged 102. But many, many years before, when she was just 19, she became a victim of Nazi sterilization. She was the daughter of a German pastor, and while the Nazis didn't deem her to be essentially non-German, she had a breakdown in her teens when she heard about the advent of another war. She was diagnosed with schizophrenia. In an asylum, she was treated to what we now call torture, although back then, doctors said they were curative measures. This included drenching her daily with ice-cold water as if that would suddenly make her better. One day, she woke up with a scar on her abdomen, which she and her parents were told was from an appendectomy. She actually still had her appendix. The doctors had cut into her and sterilized her. This was terrible, but she could so easily have been a victim of euthanasia. Ima Spaniard also survived. She talked with the BBC in 2005 when she was aged 80. She said, with little food and hard work, it was hard to survive for long in the camp. In her own words, she said, Auschwitz was an enormous terrain, 40 kilometers on the ground. So you had to work there, building roads or barracks. To do that for 10 hours a day and stand up for an hour in the morning and in the evening, especially with the kind of food we ate, made it impossible to survive for longer than a few weeks. She said she met many girls who were sterilized at her camp. She called them beautiful young Greek girls, virgins, whose ovaries were x-rayed. She said they all suffered burns, and she was the nurse who treated those burns. Some of them died from their injuries, especially when radiation treatment was exchanged for chemicals being injected into their ovaries. She told the BBC around 80 women were operated on like this. I remember them well because I was told to administer their anesthetic. At that moment, I was not so afraid to do this, but later on, after the war ended, I thought to myself, what have I done? It's now believed anywhere from 300,000 to 450,000 people were sterilized by the Nazis from 1933 to 1945, although we can't be sure just how many people survived and how many died. Now you need to watch the World War II Nazi Breeding Plan or have a look at the Nazi House of Shutters.